Dear viewers, uh, a good day to you and welcome to the digital launch of the Friesland Campina Institute Nigeria. If I'm correctly informed, we are over with 400 people um, in this virtual room. So it's very interesting uh, to be here. My name is Rolf Bos, uh, responsible for the Friesland Campina Institute. And together with the team, I'm very pleased that we reached this milestone. As you know, uh, we plan for a face-to-face -face meeting. Obviously, the current circumstances don't allow to do that. That's a pity, but I'm confident that in the future, we will be able to meet in person. And personally, I would love that very much. The current situation requires from all of us flexibility and implementation of new ways to collaborate. And exactly collaboration that is what we as a team from the Friesland Campina Institute are looking out for. We want uh, scientific collaboration with you, the professionals in Nigeria. So let me explain to you some of the fundamental principles of the Friesland Campina Institute. So I'm trying to move my slide. Yes. So that's a picture of me, um, but I guess, and I have met some of you already, but this is... Um, so the Friesland Campina Institute uh, for global structured and proactive stakeholder engagement. The Institute is truly global. Uh, we have branches in, in the China, Indonesia, the Netherlands, um, also in the UK. So we are really uh, a global institute and today we launch Nigeria. We all are already active, but um, I'm very happy that we are in Nigeria now via this uh, <coughs> digital platform. So why as institute do we think this is important? Because we think that dairy plays an important role uh, in world world nutrient security. We believe by unlessing the science and, and, and science-based information on the role of dairy in the diet that we can make uh, contribute to a better nutritional status of people in various countries. To do so, our goal is to stimulate knowledge exchange for better nutrition. Knowledge exchange because that's also always bi-directional. We don't know about the details of the situation in Nigeria. So we need to collaborate to understand better what we can contribute and how you can contribute to us. So it's really a both ways. How do we do this? Well, it's our intention to share knowledge, stimulate debate uh, and engage in an active way with nutrition and health stakeholders and professionals. And our communication platform uh, for health professionals and nutrition and dairy will help with that. And let me explain a few more words on that. So there are several activities and services that we provide. Uh, we organize scientific conferences and in a minute, uh, in a few minutes, uh, Dr. Anders Gaagma will talk to you about an interesting topic and we do these more, uh, these type of things. And that is also not only with speakers from our own uh, company, so to speak, but also speakers, uh, external speakers. And we will probably invite also people uh, from Nigeria, of course. And then it's also, uh, we facilitate an accredited uh, educational programs. And you can find in the, on the website uh, these type of things. Educational tools for professionals and their clients. So we make leaflets, we make um, all sorts of materials to explain things to uh, uh, your patients and your uh, people that you advise. And in addition to that, we have round tables uh, in which we, um, and debate about certain topics because in science, as you all know, uh, it's not always that everybody sings the same tune. So that's why it's also important to uh, talk together, to have a debate and to have a discussion with each other about certain topics. But with, in all we do, we have a sort of uniform standard to guarantee our quality. Uh, and the communication, um, we split that basically in two, uh, in two ways. Uh, communication to nutrition and health professionals and communication to governments and scientists. Uh, both of them are unbranded, but if I start with the nutrition to health, uh, nutrition and health professionals, it's unbranded. Uh, it's information about dairy nutrition and health. We share it via various communication channels, 
and the communication is based on scientific consensus, on review, meta-analysis, and local guidelines. So, what, and we do this explicitly in this way because amongst nutrition and health professionals, we won't, uh, we will not allow any uh, disagreement to local uh, guidelines or consensus that there is out there. Then on the other side, we have the communication to governments and scientists. Of course, unbranded information about dairy nutrition and health. But in that section, we also stimulate debate on scientific developments and uh, new develop and new insights. Because as you all know, science is not a, uh, a fixed thing. It's, it's moving all the time. And new insights bring to new regulations and uh, also new opinions within science. So the discussion is based on the current scientific insights and regulatory changes. So this is how we split basically our communication uh, with respect to you as healthcare professionals. So we are looking forward to that, uh, to that collaboration very much. Uh, and to the end of, uh, of this uh, contribution, this modest contribution from my side, um, and, and before I hand over to my colleague, uh, Anna Schaafsma, uh, let me again express that I'm looking forward to that collaboration. I really hope that in the near future, we will have an active debate. And uh, at the beginning of the presentation, you saw that there was, uh, you had the ability to ask questions. Please use that. So forward your questions to the information uh, stated uh, at the beginning of, uh, of this webinar uh, and Anna, both Anna and myself will answer your questions. Finally, uh, to, before I hand over to Anna, uh, I wish you a view of the exceptional times wisdom to make the right decisions in your field uh, and I hope that you and all the, your loved ones will stay safe in this uh, remarkable situation. Thank you. Handing over to Dr. Schaafsma. Thank you, Rolf. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my talk. My talk will be about the role of dairy nutrition during adolescence in supporting the optimum growth and developing in early life. My name is Anna Schaarsma and I am in senior expert development in the team of the global nutrition development. So the team that Rolf is heading. I work for this company already for 42 years. So I've seen a lot of changes, but I'm still happy in whatever I do. And milk is still the core nutrient that hasn't changed at all during all these years. So that's very nice. So today I will take you through this uh, story. It uh, will be about uh, 30 slides uh, for those who love to do the countdown. And uh, in these 30 slides, I will just give you, let's say a glimpse of uh, what is uh, going on and what role milk can play because an in-depth uh, discussion would take uh, many more hours. But as Rolf said, whenever you have questions, please let us know and we will uh, answer them. I like to start uh, this talk with a few words about the importance of having a good foundation. If you look at construction works, uh, you see that a lot of work is done before the actual building will start. But you can imagine that if some mistakes are made at this moment in time, that the actual building will not have the quality as uh, intended to. And this may lead, among others, to skewed towers. So a good foundation is very important. And the same is true in human. If we do not take care of a good foundation in the, uh, the youngsters at the reproductive age, uh, so the adolescents or the young women, then you see that in the construction that of, the, of the new human that will take uh, place during pregnancy, not everything might go the way as you would like it to go. And so if there is a shortage in certain nutrients or if there is a, a not a not healthy lifestyle of the mother, uh, then you will see that the outcome, so the newborn infants, may not have the quality we would like it to have. It will at least will not make use of its uh, maximum potential uh, to become, uh, let's say, the, the, the most clever kids uh, as possible. So this is important also in Hume to take care of this foundation. 
a very important factor that plays a role in uh, in in how you will be after being born, and that is uh, uh, that is what we call the phenotype, is uh, is is taken care by epigenetics. And epigenetics is a process in which uh, the genetics are a, a bit adapted based on all the information that comes to the fetus. So this is also information on the nutritional status of the mother, but it is also information about stress situations. It is information about the amount of energy that's available. So if we do not take care of this during pregnancy, then the, uh, the, the fetus will get the wrong information and epigenetics will correct for that situation. So what we see that if uh, these kids are born, they will run higher risks in getting uh, issues with health later on in life. And it's very important to know that epigenetics and all the changes that takes place based on epigenetics, it's about 70% during pregnancy and in early life. Eh? So this pregnancy period is very important. So the foundation is very important. Epigenetics, you probably will know, is a process in which genes are switched on and off. And because of this, you see that transcription takes place or does not take place, take place anymore. If we look at, uh, at, at, uh, at creating a situation where you have the, the, the biggest chance of being in good health later on, you see that uh, a lot of things, uh, nutrition is one of the factors that plays a role. And if we look at nutrition, we know there are nutritional guidelines. Every country has nutritional guidelines. And on a global scale, we also see these guidelines from the WHO. However, if you start comparing nutritional guidelines uh, of, of the, the several countries, as we did in Europe with the Eureka uh, project, you will find that there are quite some differences in recommendations. In other words, we are not really uh, consistent in what the real requirement of certain nutrients uh, is. Another way that the people look at the nutrition is going back to ancient, ancient times and try to find out how did the diet look like many years ago when we as a human, uh, modern human being started to develop, at least when our brain started to grow. And what you find out that there is a short list of nutrients that are always debated based on what we find and uh, uh, in or what we know about the diets in ancient time and what we recommend today. So there is discussion about protein, iodine, selenium, iron, DHA, vitamin D, vitamin B12, folic acid and magnesium. And most of these uh, nutrients in this list are uh, not, at least are, let me say it in this way, are marginal in the modern human diet. And they all play a very important role in the quality of the pregnancy, but also in growth and in health and in brain development. So all important issues in particular during adolescence. And also studies uh, uh, in particular uh, performed in the developing countries and this is a study that looked into uh, a couple of African countries, show that there is really a, uh, a, an, an undernutrition in certain uh, micronutrients. Uh, most often the studies focus on micronutrients. So iron is a very well-known one. We see there is a high uh, incidence of uh, iron deficiency, and that may lead, of course, to the iron-related disorders like anemia. And anemia is not only caused by iron deficiency, also other causes but iron deficiency still is a very important factor. Uh, but you also see that vitamin A still uh, might be deficient. There is not too much information about folate or iodine, which is rare because everybody starts, uh, talks about iodine, iodine deficiency. And there is also some uh, information available about zinc. And so there are a lot of nutrients more that we have to take into account when we start talking about uh, improving the diet. Well, milk could play a role in, in that. Um, mammalian milks, and uh, I, I will limit this to the breast milk and the cow's milk, are produced and are a complete food for the newborn infant. But milk is not always a complete food for uh, older children or adolescents or adults. And the reason is that 
um, the body knows that at birth the infant has certain stores that, uh, it, that, that it gets during the pregnancy period and some of these nutrients are not added to the milk by the, by the mother. And iron and vitamin D are two examples. So you hardly can influence their levels in breast milk and you hardly also can influence their levels in cow's milk. DHA is another story. Most breast milks and cow's milk in particular are uh, very limited in the amounts of DHA, but this is much more a problem of being not sufficiently present in the maternal diet. So the moment you increase DHA in the maternal diet, then you see that the amounts will also increase in, uh, in the milk. You can express the value of milk uh, based on uh, what we call nutrient density score. And there are several ways to calculate the nutrient density, but in all circumstances, it is a ratio between the amount you find in the milk and uh, related to the energy as compared to the recommended uh, amount of that particular nutrient related to the recommended energy. And to make this story not too difficult, uh, all nutrients that are above the line uh, zero of the line one indicate that they are very uh, present in that particular food. In this case, and that is where milk is known for, of course, it's calcium and it's iodine and it's the, the B vitamins that are very rich in milk. You see that protein is at the level of one. It means it is in balance with the energy, but it is a very high, very high quality protein, of course. And you see a couple of other nutrients that are also blue colored. It also becomes clear that there are nutrients that are not uh, uh, very high, uh, not present in very high levels in milk. Uh, I already talked about the iron and the vitamin D, but there are a couple of more. And so for the newborn, this is sufficient, eh, but for adults, and in particular, if you like to do uh, to deal with, for instance, an iron deficiency, you see that milk as such is not very helpful. And in these cases, you have to enrich the product. And then we have the target group, the adolescents. And this is not the most easiest target group. This is a challenge. And we all know as parents that adolescents, at least that is what we think, do not listen to what we say and they always have their own opinions. Um, and what we also see, and that, that's, that's very important if you think about a good foundation early in life, is that some of them are picky eaters. And because of this, they create eating disorders. Uh, they are much more into the snacks, uh, and to the funny foods, then into the vegetables and the dairy. They also uh, start to fall in love, and because of that, they pay a lot of attention and also money, as, uh, as they told me, in, into all kinds of uh, tools that help them to be more beauty and look uh, much better than uh, their uh, uh, rivals. Uh, and that makes it also very difficult to uh, to challenge to to challenge them with a product they like and that also contributes to uh, their health. Uh, this is a nice study that uh, was done in in Africa and it really shows that uh, the eating the percentage of eating disorders in this target group is uh, can be quite high. Eh? So we talk about 25 percent. That's not Africa, of course. This is more worldwide, 25% uh, in Iran, uh, and, but in Nigeria, it's also, uh, I think, around 18%. And that's quite a big percentage of this target group. And in some way, we should try to handle that. Growth is very important eh, because they all uh, uh, start growing very fast and very rapidly around 12, uh, 13 years old, eh, and they keep on growing until uh, 1820 quite fast and for this of course you need some uh, some building materials and protein is uh, in this most probably a very maybe the most important uh, nutrient and if we start talking about protein it's it, we have to keep uh, two things in in mind first of all it's the quality of protein because the lower the quality the more of the protein you have to consume uh, and the amount that is uh, recommended or required. 
the, well, the quality of the protein is in particular based on what we call the indispensable amino acids, the amino acids that we have to consume via the diets, so the ones that we cannot uh, make ourselves. And you see over here in this slide the list of these indispensable amino acids. And if they are present in the protein and in, uh, in good amounts, then you see that the quality will increase. And when one is missing or when one of the amounts is very low, you also see that the quality of the protein is decreasing. With regard to the recommended intakes, uh, the infants in, have a quite a high recommend, a requirement of protein per kilogram of body weight. Uh, but what you see is that during aging, this amount of protein per kilogram per day uh, will decrease. And of course, the absolute amount will increase. Uh, if you uh, have a higher body weight, then you need absolutely more protein. Uh, but per kilogram of body weight, the requir requirement will decrease. There is also a difference between male and female. Uh, the difference is not very big, but it's good to keep that in mind. Uh, the only moment in life where protein uh, requirement increase uh, is during pregnancy, uh, where there is a higher need for protein because yeah, also the fetus will uh, need protein, and during lactation. So lactation is not in this slide here, but also lactation needs some additional protein. The quality of protein uh, can be expressed in a score. We call it the digestible indispensable amino acid score, the diase. Uh, and in fact, this, this looks a little bit like the nutrition density calculation. Uh, you have a reference uh, protein, so a reference amount of an amino acid. And you have the amount of the amino acid in the diet. And uh, you can calculate the ratio. The interesting part of this score is, is, is that the amino acid in the diet is corrected for the digestibility. So the amount uh, in the dietary protein is not exactly the amount that is also uh, uh, absorbed and is available for the building of tissues in the body. So that's where the D in the diet score comes from. Well, if you look at uh, this score uh, with regard to milk protein, you see that the score is 1.22 for the age group six months up to three years. And so every age, groups, uh, age group has, a, has an own reference uh, protein. Mm -hmm. And so it is 1.22 for six months, and it is 1.43 for three years and older. So that's very interesting because this score is higher than one, meaning that it has, it's, it's, it's a complete protein, it has a very good quality, but it gives also a little bit more. And so you can use this protein uh, to compensate for lower quality proteins in the diet. And that's very interesting if we look at milk. Tristan Campina did a uh, literature research, uh, also in collaboration with uh, colleagues, of course, uh, from uh, Tristan Campina uh, Wamco. And um, this uh, review, in this review, we used the studies published in uh, Nigeria, uh, in particular coming from the southern states in Nigeria, and which also means that the conclusions from this uh, review are uh, overestimating, let's say, the protein consumption, at in particular in the north, northern part of Nigeria, because the uh, financial situation in that part of Nigeria is less than in the southern part, and uh, which also means that if you have less money, you cannot buy the high protein quality foods, or at least in lower amounts. Uh, in general, the outcome of this paper was that, in fact, the protein consumption was not too bad in Nigeria, uh, most often according to uh, the, the recommendations, with the exception of the women of reproductive age or the pregnant women. So these two groups uh, seem to have a lower protein consumption than recommended. Uh, if we look at the pregnant adolescents, uh, you see that the protein intake is about 50 gram per day, but the recommendation is 71 gram. Uh, so this gives us a gap of 20 grams of protein per day. 
what could that mean during this period? Well, it has, it could have, it probably has an impact on birth weight. So it will decrease birth weight. It probably um, uh, will also affect a couple of other uh, issues that deal with, uh, with development. And it is estimated that this will have an impact on the risk on uh, having illnesses later in life, but maybe also uh, in development early in life. So this is a uh, of uh, this is uh, of uh, quite some concern to see this gap. Next to that, um, if you look at the components of the Nigerian diet, and this will be far from from complete, uh, but I think it gives an overall impression. You see that the intake of high quality protein that has to be supplied by meat, fish and shellfish and dairy products is quite low. So there is a small contribution of high quality protein and there is the majority of the protein intake is covered by, let's say, the cereals and the grains. And so and we know that uh, the cereal and grain do not uh, uh, it, it's still good protein in particular if you look at soya soya beans uh, for instance but you also see that there is uh, that the protein quality is not comparable to the quality as we see uh, as we calculate from the milk protein so this is also something to take into account um, I did a small calculation. Um, if you take a, an example, as, as by example, a mixed Nigerian meal that is composed out of tilapia, which is a fish, a rice and cowpea, each contributing 50 grams to the, to the total meal, you can calculate the diase, and you see that this diase will come up to 0.82, so which is less than one. And less than one means that the quality of the protein is not ideal, because then it should be one. If you add 200 ml of milk uh, and you start calculating with the digestible amounts of, uh, of protein and you look at the limiting amounts of the amino acids in the diet, valine and tryptophan, then you see that just by adding this relatively small amount of, of, uh, of milk, you can increase the diet of this meal very close to one. Eh? It's 0.99, uh, but normally we would say this is one. So this is a very interesting uh, uh, finding. You also see that if you look at the diet scores of beef and chicken and milk and eggs, they are above one, and that's all already what we also showed before for milk, but also soya beans is not a bad source of protein. It's also one, and so uh, if you would be able to, uh, to bring in soya beans in the meal, that also would be very beneficial. Another thing that's uh, very important with regard to growth is the increase in bone. Eh? And not only uh, it, it will, of course, uh, take care of the growth in height, uh, but it is also important that bone mass, so the, 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 the mass of the, the, the bone, eh, the total amount of bone, that it also increases. And this graph nicely shows, and it probably is a well-known graph for all of you, is, is that you have a gain in bone uh, more or less up till the age of 25. And after that, if you do your utmost best, you can stabilize it until you are 50. And after 50, everybody will see a decrease in bone. Well, there are some exceptions, of course, but most of us will see this decrease. A difference between when, uh, men and women, well known. But interesting is, is, is this level, what we, the highest level, which is called peak bone mass. And in particular, uh, it's of interest to reach the highest peak bone mass as possible. And that is something we have to start with uh, during adolescence uh, because it will take a couple of years because you have to, before you have this in place. And this can be done with, uh, with adaptations in nutrition or taking care of good nutrition and uh, taking care of good physical activity. So how does this bone uh, mass increases? Well, uh, there is a constant process going on, going on in bone, uh, which is called bone turnover. This is a cycle that takes about six months. It, it, it means that part of the bone is broken down 
and then there is a uh, then again it's about foundation huh? a new foundation takes place and new bone is is, is built uh, and this cycle is at all ages in place also at young ages immediately if you start uh, working on bone you start also working on the breakdown and this is necessary to take care of small damages that uh, every day take place in your bone and you have to you can repair it in this way during uh, up to the age of 25 you see that this cycle will uh, will be positive it means that it will deliver more bone so the formation is higher than the breakdown speed uh, then there is a stabilization period during 25 up to 50 years and after that you see the cycle becomes negative uh, and you will lose bone and it's for the for the cycle, it's very important to have a couple of things in place. First of all, we talk about the building blocks, and so in this case, the nutrients. So calcium, magnesium uh, are very uh, important for the whole cycle, uh, but also protein. And sometimes we say milk is bad for bone because of the high protein, and most often that is related to the acidity that takes place uh, during the metabolism of protein, but I will come back to that later. But I can tell you that milk protein does not play a single negative role in those, this whole turnover and you need protein to take care of the, 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 the construction. Then also vitamin D and vitamin K are important, but they are not uh, uh, present in milk at very high levels. And so with regard to milk, calcium, magnesium and protein are uh, the ones uh, we focus on. About the acidity of the metabolism. Uh, we talk about alkaline of acidic uh, metabolism. Uh, bear in mind that alkaline is, uh, the alkaline metabolism is the one that was also in place at ancient times. So it's, it's what we say the more normal situation. You see that alkaline as, uh, metabolism is supported by the consumption of vegetables and fruits, whereas the acidic uh, metabolism, uh, metabolism is, is most often caused by the intake of foods with bad protein uh, and, uh, and, and stable foods play a role in this. Fortunately, shown in this graph, you see that milk is neutral with regard to uh, this aspect. And so it is not alkaline, but it is also not acidic. And so if you add milk to your diet, at least you, have not, you do not have to worry about uh, this issue. Uh, on the other hand, of course, it, uh, we would love to have milk uh, being alkaline because we know that uh, the acidic metabolism is a, an issue in the Western population and it would be good if we could repair also that a little bit with milk, but that's not possible, but at least I'm happy that it is neutral in this aspect. And then the exercises as well I talked about, um, we know that exercises are important. That's also why we said uh, years ago, uh, uh, we sat together with a physiotherapist and two orthopedic surgeons to find out, okay, what are the most breakable spots at older age? Uh, and uh, by training the muscles uh, at these particular places, you see that the bone mass is triggered to put on more mass at these sites. And so this is not only important at older age, this is also important during the age of 25 to 50, where you like to stabilize your bone, but it is also important during adolescence because at that moment in time you already work on the architecture of your bone. So the direction of the forces on bone is very important for the strength of bone at that particular part, and that is something we have to realize during adolescence. So this small set of uh, simple exercises in particular, now we have a lockdown in houses, I think uh, is something to recommend. Uh, do them because uh, it's easy, you do not need any uh, specific tools for it. Vitamin D is an everlasting uh, discussion. Uh, it's very important for bone, but also for immunity. Uh, we know that uh, worldwide there still is quite some vitamin D insufficiency uh, and this also occurs in sunny countries. So it's worthwhile to tell a little bit more about that. If you look at the relation uh, mother and newborn, you see that the newborn is depending on the uh, stores of the mother, the, the vitamin D status of the mother, but is always lagging behind about 10 to 20%. 
Well, this is an interesting. Uh, uh, this is interesting to know because it means that if you can say something about the vitamin D status of the newborn, you can estimate the vitamin D status of the mother. Uh, and that is what we uh, looked at in a study we performed in Ibadan in collaboration with Professor Idowu Ayide. Uh, we did a study with premature infants, so we also collected their blood at the age of 14 days. And uh, based on that level, uh, we calculated uh, an estimated um, the status of the mother. And what you see in this graph is that although the mothers, uh, most of the mothers are above the cutoff values for vitamin D deficiency uh, of the WHO, they are below the acknowledged sufficiency levels as we today use them most often. Uh, and this level is 75 nanomol per liter of 25 OHD and 25 OHD is the parameter we use in blood analysis to say something about the vitamin D status. But you also see that the level, the estimated level in the mothers is far below the preferred status and the preferred status is higher than the acknowledged uh, sufficiency. Uh, but more and more we see that the 100 nanomol per liter is something we should take as a kind of target to reach, let's say, the, the, the most optimal uh, vitamin D uh, status. So I already said, uh, what about milk? Uh, that milk is not a good source of vitamin D. Is this something we can change? Well, for that reason, we did some feeding trials. What we found out that yes, indeed, if the sun is uh, sun bathing, uh, you see that it will increase the vitamin D3 uh, levels in the body itself. Uh, and even via feed, you can increase the levels in milk a little bit with vitamin D2. But in the end, and whatever you do, you never will reach uh, relevant levels of vitamin D in milk. So it seems that milk is quite protected with regard to the entrance of vitamin D. And this is also what we see in human breast milk. And so for some reason, here the kid, the newborn, depends on the stores that are available during pregnancy. And it also points to the importance of adolescence, uh, well, not to avoid the sun uh, too much. Eh? So take, uh, take healthy periods of sun bathing. And if that's not uh, possible or not sufficient, take care of uh, uh, vitamin D supplements. Then a few slides on brain support. Uh, very important. Again, if you look at what is happening during puberty and adolescence, that's quite interesting. Normally, we talk about brain growth and development, in particular during the first uh, three years of life. Uh, but uh, realize that also during adolescence, there are two more small brain growth spurts. Uh, and there are the important hormonal changes. And so gonadal hormones come in that uh, assures that there are some organizational uh, and structural changes in the brain. And uh, another important issue is, is that uh, these kids have a delayed synthesis of melatonin, which means that in the evening they don't like to go to bed. Eh? Probably this is well known to you that they don't like to go to bed, but they also do not feel sleepy because they do not have this trigger. Uh, we like to have them in bed early uh, and they also have the problem not to, uh, they don't want to get out of bed early because of this delayed melatonin synthesis, you also see that in the morning they still feel sleepy. Well, they have to get out of bed most often because they have to go to school. This creates stress and in the end it also creates sleep deficiency. And this is something that has been uh, noticed in, uh, in, this, uh, in this age category. So how can milk play a role in this? Can we support these adolescents and pubers in this difficult period uh, for both for them and the parents? Uh, yes, because milk in the evening, for instance, will supply tryptophan and tryptophan is a precursor of serotonin and serotonin is a precursor of melatonin. So at least if what we can do is try to stimulate the whole synthesis of melatonin as early as possible. And when it is produced, that it is also produced in sufficient amounts. That will at least also calm down and take out part of the stress. At daytime, the milk supplies tyrosine, and at that time of the, of the day, 
the tyrosine, the dopamine that is produced from tyrosine uh, will support alertness uh, and so will keep the kids uh, more awake. That's, that's more or less the theory. Uh, you will not find, I think, very hard figures when you really are going to study this, but there are indications that indeed uh, these uh, two amino acids contribute to, let's say, the, the day and the, and the nighttime behaviors. So if we look at the next slide, uh, how can, it, can this help us? Yes, because I already discussed the tyrosine and the tryptophan. Uh, that will support alertness, which is of interest uh, when they are at work or when they are at school. Uh, moreover, milk is also a supplier of magnesium. Uh, magnesium is known for its role in, 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 in improving memory, uh, so that's very interesting. And milk is also supplying lactose, and lactose is a, a slow-release energy source you have the glucose that comes from lactose, which is immediately used also by the brain uh, as, as an energy source. And you have the galactose that is transformed in glycogen in particular, and the glycogen is used when the glucose levels drop down. And so uh, you have a provision of energy during a longer period uh, of time. And uh, moreover, uh, milk is a tooth-friendly product. And so it's not a product uh, because of this lactose that will give you uh, uh, an increased risk on caries. No, if you consume the milk as such, it's very neutral uh, and it at least will not stimulate the caries uh, development. Then we have, of course, DHA. DHA uh, in the milk depends on the maternal intake. So for cows and the way we feed the cows nowadays, uh, you will hardly find any docosahexaenoic acid in the milk. Um, but still, I like to say a couple of things uh, about this because uh, we did some research in uh, Tanzania and based on this research in mothers and newborns, we know that uh, there, there is a certain value you like to reach with DHA in the body. Uh, and this value is now uh, determined as being 8 gram percent of total fatty acids in red blood cells. That's very interesting because now you can steer also via food. Uh, uh, in, you, you can change food in such a way that we are going to reach these levels. And this level is good for the mother because uh, during lactation you will not see a decrease in the DHA of the, uh, at the mother's side. It's also good for the cardiovascular system, brain immune system and epigenetics. And this is coming from other research that indicates that in particular, these levels are necessary to have the highest impact. It's good for the infant <coughs> because it will have a good start at life. But also the levels in breast milk are higher when the mother has sufficient DHA stores. So that's interesting because now we know what are the most ideal levels in breast milk if the mother is in optimal status. We also can say something about the mother status when we know the levels in breast milk. Again, we go to the study we did in Ibadan. Uh, we, uh, we also collected the breast milk of the mothers and we calculated, we analyzed the fatty acid pattern. So we know the level of DHA in breast milk. And what we can conclude from the Ibadan study is that the mothers that contribute to that study are close to sufficient with regard to that DHA status. From literature, we had information about the fatty acid pattern of the Fulani milk. And based on these figures, we can say that these mothers are insufficient with regard, with regard to DHA. So you see that in one country, there is quite a difference in being sufficient or not sufficient. And that is, of course, uh, 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 because the diet is determining the amount of DHA in, in the milk uh, and, of course, uh, the DHA status. So the tilapia, which is a frequently eaten fish in Nigeria, is quite a good source of uh, DHA, uh, but you need to consume the 85 grams uh, on a daily basis uh, to be able to consume the recommended amount. Uh, and that is quite a struggle, I would say. Milk is not a very good source of DHA, as explained. Uh, however, uh, we can add DHA in case we would like to fill this gap uh, by using diet of uh, dairy products. Which brings me to uh, more or less concluding slides. Uh, yes, one glass of milk per day can be very useful for adolescents. 
everywhere in the world, I would say, or an equivalent of one glass of milk, which is 25 grams of milk powder. Uh, there are the most well-known nutrients uh, in milk, uh, but beside that, if you like to complete uh, the milk and fill some nutritional gaps, we are aware of, then that, is, uh, be done, that can be done and we talk about the fortified products. Just two uh, small uh, stories. Uh, in ancient times, we awoke at first daylight because we were very hungry, hungry and we had to look for food. And this was most important to survive. And today, uh, farmers awake at first daylight to milk the cows. And this is very useful to complete your diet. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed your lecture. If you have any questions, please let us know. And I hope to talk to you soon or see you in Nigeria whenever we will find the time and uh, to go there. And uh, the moment the virus is gone, I think we can start talking about uh, our travels. Thank you very much.